Well, uh, I am very excited that we are beginning our Easter series today and approaching Easter weekend next week. I did want to mention uh, that uh, some of the ideas from this talk and uh, the, the title, uh, Can You See Him? actually is from Craig Grishel, uh, really inspiring thoughts and I, uh, an idea, and also the graphic out in the lobby. Uh, for so many people, Jesus is at a distance. So for so many people, they don't see him the way he really is. And as the, 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 uh, the poster points out so well, uh, often the, the, the view of Jesus is not in focus with people. And, and even with us, truth be told, often. And what we want to do is bring, bring Jesus into focus. Even, even as we think about the worship and the lyrics of the song, talking about the grace that's been extended to us in the person of Jesus, we're bringing him into focus in our lives. As we begin uh, this, uh, th this series today, uh, Can You See Him? We're starting off with, with today's talk, which is seeing is believing. Now that may be different than you've heard it before. Seeing is believing, and we're looking at a story in John chapter 9 where Jesus heals a blind man, and then in his healing, he believes in Jesus. Yesterday, I thought I would go through the story and count all of the questions of of the stories in the New Testament, I, I'm not sure, but I got a feeling this has got to be one of those stories that has the most questions throughout the story. So actually, if you count the number of times people are asking questions in this story and the number of times people say, I don't know, add those together, I counted 19 times in this story. It's incredible. Very apropos to the days in which we live. And I could ask you, do you have any questions <laughs> for God? One of, our, uh, one of our sisters is going to be passing through the one-year mark tomorrow at the loss of her husband, who's now in heaven. She's got some questions that I don't have answers for. Yesterday, we had this wonderful event here at the church, the extra special event. Many of you will know about that, and that was when we had uh, the, the joy of hosting a number of families with uh, children with disabilities, and it was an egg hunt, and just great time, fun, and games, and all those sorts of things, and I had time to uh, speak with one of the moms who many of you would know, and she's a believer and loves Jesus, and it's, it's Melody, and she, she has her daughter Scarlett, who's here, who is, who's disabled, and lots of questions, we're talking, and and as, as Mel is just kind of unpacking what life is like right now, we, we may pray, and I pray for, for this miraculous to take place, but between now and, and a miracle, they need the grace of God, and there's a lot of questions to be asked that actually don't have answers. To extend further from our, our own life and and perhaps those we, we know and love into the, the wider communities around us, all kinds of questions and, and doubts and what is going on and if God is real, what about this? And so there is such a spectrum of experiences that people have and perhaps even here represented today. We've got people who are, are, are doubting and people who are questioning and skeptics and just a whole range of of emotional, psychological, emotional sorts of uh, feelings and thoughts as we think about faith. And as we approach Easter, I think we need to realize that that is exactly what the context of the resurrection was all about. We had people who had heard rumors about what could happen and others had hopes of what was going to happen. And when the crucifixion came on we call Good Friday, their hopes were dashed. And there, there was such a thought and feeling of, of disillusionment and hopelessness and questions and queries and doubts and skepticism. And that's what this culture, maybe our lives too, is experiencing is all about. And what I'm hoping for all of us today, and as we move into next week, is that Jesus would come into view and we'd see him. 
And after today, certainly we, we would understand that you don't have to understand everything to believe in something. I think it was Andy Stanley that said that. What a brilliant thought. You don't have to understand everything to believe in something. Let's take up the story uh, we're going to read today, John chapter 9. <clears throat> I'm just going to gloss through it. It's quite a long story. I'll leave it for you to go home and read the, all of the details of it. But what I've been trying to do myself, and I would encourage you to do the same thing. <clears throat> we read through these things. Some of us, maybe we've read them multiple times before. Gloss over it as it's information. Can we put ourselves in this story? Can we think a little more deeply for a moment? Can, can we appropriate what was meant in the words, in the context of how they were spoken? So here is Jesus and his disciples. And it says, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. In my last year of high school, in the first few years of university, my best friend was blind. His name's Kevin. Kevin's gone on to be with Jesus. So uh, my job with Kevin every day was because we had the first class together. He would take my arm and uh, we'd go to his next class and I'd take him and, and if I wasn't with him, uh, you'd often hear the rat-a-tat-tat of his cane uh, in the hallways. And so we, we spent a lot of time together. And uh, then into university, we did the same sorts of things, and I'd take them to classes. And uh, it's an interesting conversation when you're talking about color for a person who's never experienced color. So Jesus and his disciples meet this man blind from birth. In that day and age, when they're blind, they can't learn. There's no, there's no educational system. My friend Kevin, he... <laughs> He could multiply two, three-digit numbers in his head. It took him a while. It takes me a while, too, to do it on paper. Guy was brilliant. He'd be working away at his abacus and his stylus, and then he got a computer that could talk to him. Not in those days. If you're born blind... You are relegated to a life of begging. What if you didn't have a family to support you? This is, this is, this is tragedy. So, the disciples make this comment. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? And now, now we're jumping into something that is really important for us to get. These people, these Jew, this Jewish religion, Judaism, and actually every religious system, truth be told, every religious system based on a text, based on a series of, if I can just say it like this, boxes to check off. A, a list of do's and don'ts, and we know the Ten Commandments, for example. Uh, a system that's based on what we call law, based on a codified set of exemplary actions that need to be met in order to find acceptance, however it may go. Any system that's based, I'll say law, you know what I mean by that then. Any system based on law leads in this direction. So we talk about slippery slopes all the time. This is the slippery slope of a codified system of law that justifies you according to performance. What will happen is, as you slide down that ramp, it's so easy to adopt this mindset of, hey, I've, I've been following all the rules. That person has it. There must some, be something bad that's going to happen to them. And now we've got tragedy right in front of us. And this is actually the logical, it's not, well, it's not really logical, but the, the, the natural conclusion to a mindset steeped in rule following. He didn't follow the rules. Or was it his parents that didn't follow the rules? And now this is the consequence of that. God must be punishing him. Actually, that came up in conversation yesterday. There's still people that think that. Well, maybe you don't have someone who is blind or disabled or have those kinds of conditions in your life. What about, what about the, the parent whose daughter or son is lost in drug use? Do you automatically think, oh, you know what? They probably aren't a good parent. 
Probably they're not good parents, didn't raise them in the right way because that's happened to them. Or you see something that's gone on in a family and it's dysfunctional. Oh, you know what? Must be bad family, bad parents. Is, is, is that something that happens to you? Do you find your mind going there? Well, if you do, and that's natural for all of us, then what we want is to understand what the grace of Jesus is all about. And that bad things happen to good people. And that, yes, bad decisions can be made, but that doesn't mean that people have done something wrong. And certainly God's point of view is not that someone has done something wrong, so I'm going to punish them. The grace of God brought Jesus to the cross, which we'll, we'll talk about on Friday night. And there at the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins. And when the thought comes into your mind, hey, this bad thing that's come and happened to me, and, and, and all, you know, this, this circumstance that is just overwhelming my life, maybe it's because I'm not holy enough, I'm not good enough, I've done something wrong. And I want to tell you from the front right here what the truth is. The truth is that Jesus paid for those things, and he doesn't have to pay for it twice. Bad things happen to good people. And I'll tell you what, sometimes our choices bring bad things into our life. I can get drunk and drive and have an accident, become a quadriplegic, and it's not because the judgment of God's on my life. It's because I've made a decision and it, and it is the process has brought me to a conclusion, but God's not mad at you. Man, God loved you so much. He sent his son to take your place. God's not mad at you. Jesus stunned his audience in the reply. Who sinned? This man or his parents that he'd be born blind. Neither this man or his parents have sinned. This man is in the condition that he is in so that the work of God can be manifest in his life. In other words... When you see someone in a situation that is dire, that is desperate, when you see a situation near, close, or far away, it is there so that the love of Christ can move in and make a difference and God can be glorified in it. We live in a fallen world. And if, if your worldview doesn't hold that, then there will be making no sense of what reality means. The worldview that we need to adopt, the Christian worldview, is that Sin entered the world. It's like a monster. And we don't, we don't give sin the, the, uh, the we, don't, we don't acknowledge the, the power that it has wreaked and the havoc that it's wreaked on humanity. We live in a fallen world. And because of that, bad things happen. And in that fallen world, Jesus said, it's time for the works of God to be manifest and they must happen during the day when everyone can work. When night is coming, there's an end coming when it's no longer possible. This world's gonna wrap up and, and it's, it's gonna be too late. Jesus said, and while I am here, I am the light of the world. Well, Jesus lives in you if you're a Jesus follower. And so you've got the heart and the life of Jesus in you. And now when you come across a circumstance, he wants you to step in. And folks, it may be starting with prayer. Maybe there's nothing physically that you can do. But to step in to your world with the life and the love of Christ so that in the midst of brokenness and difficulty and sins ravishing in people's lives, you can make a difference and the life of Jesus can be manifest. Friday night, Carrie and I were at, uh, having dinner with friends of ours, and they, they, they don't know Jesus yet. Like, uh, well, they don't know Jesus yet, period. And, uh, you know, they love God in their own way. Amazing people. As they're talking about their story, heartache and brokenness and tragedy, not of their own making, and wow, and, and, and how they have overcome so many things and have such great attitudes and such uh, love and care for other people is totally amazing. And then I found out half an hour after we left, they got tragic news of a death in the family that just 
devastated them. Well, obviously, we can't do anything. But what a joy to call and to talk and to listen and empathize and pray. We can all, we can all step in. Jesus said, this situation, this blindness, is an opportunity for God to step in and demonstrate who he is. Life is filled with things that we don't understand. That's, that's just the way it is. Okay, let me just step to the side of the serious matter for a moment. Some of you are looking sad. Now that I can see your faces. Okay, so, many years ago, Carrie and I went on the holiday with, with, with our kids. I can't remember where it was. But what I do remember is there was this horse. I think it was a Shetland pony, actually. But there was this horse that they had trained to do arithmetic. And so the guy got in front of the horse, and he asked it a, uh, an arithmetic question. And the horse struck its hoof on the ground and moved its head and got the right answer. Anybody ever see that horse or a horse like that? Nobody? Nobody. You guys, where, where do you guys live? You're missing great things. So I was amazed. I was amazed. And then there was a subtraction question. And wow, this horse knows arithmetic. This horse understands. They got in front of the horse. Okay, so I was, I was, I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about that. As amazed as I was about that horse, do you know, if they were to put before the horse complex mathematics, the horse wouldn't understand. I'm convinced. If they were to put calculus and questions in front of that horse, calculus invented by Isaac Newton, we all know that, right? The horse would not know it. What about logarithms? I love logarithms. If they were to put logarithms in front of that horse, invented by John Napier, by the way, the horse would not understand. If they were to put complex Cartesian geometry in front of that horse, developed by Rene Descartes, the horse wouldn't understand it. But we knew that, didn't we? Because you should never put Descartes before. You understand. That is, that is the only math joke I know. Okay, so. It's not bad, it's great. Okay, so where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? Well, I'm telling you just because everybody should know a math joke, but if we talk about what a horse understands and what I understand and what God understands, do you understand that my capacity is much closer to the horse than to God? Actually, that wasn't supposed to be a joke. Can we just stop for a moment and think about it? My intellectual capacity, the intellectual capacity of a horse in the mind of God, I'm way closer to the horse than I am to God. Why am I so befuddled when I don't understand something? Why, why, does it, why, why is it that, that it troubles me so when I don't have answers? I'll tell you. My wife is on her way like a decade ago to London University Hospital for an eight-hour brain operation. And I'm way back and I'm following in, in my car. And that, you know, hour, whatever it is, drive, there's all kinds of questions going through my mind. And every one of those questions was unanswerable. Well, what of this? And what of this? And what about that? And, and why this? And, and why this? And, and what's going to happen? And, and if this happens, how? Uh, and I, I just realized I, I am facing all of these things that I don't know. And they're actually inanswerable. And the only thing that I knew was it didn't matter what I felt like. And it doesn't matter what things look like, what matters is that Jesus was with us and his grace is cascading over us like a waterfall. And because I don't understand everything doesn't mean I can't believe in something. And that's, that's what happens when Jesus comes into focus and we see him. And I don't know, so much stuff I, I don't know, but 
he becomes the anchor to my soul. And it's not a list of, it's not a list of things that I believe. It's a person who I experience that relationship I have with him. And he becomes the anchor. And oh, there, there's a ton of stuff that is unexplainable. But there are also so many things that are undeniable. And moving on to the story, let, let me just say, uh, I'll, I'll speed it up. Our time is coming close to an end. As you read through the story, Jesus spits on the ground. Okay, this is weird. Let's just, can we just say that? Like the, it's, it's just a weird story. He spits on the ground, and he makes some mud from the spit. What would happen if you sent your kid off to school with a sore eye? They come back, and they tell you that the teacher, they spit in the, in the ground and made mud and put it in. We'd have lawsuits going on, okay? I'm just telling you. This is a little on the weird side. I don't, I don't understand that. Jesus says, now go, take, uh, take yourself and go to the pool of Siloam and, and wash yourself. And I don't know, I'm just thinking the guy's thinking, well, praise God, because I want to get this stuff off my face. And so he's healed. Interesting in the story, NIV version at least says, then he was healed, he could see, and he went home. He didn't go back to Jesus. He went home. And when he went home, all of his neighbors and his parents saw him. And... They, well, he could see, obviously. We don't know how old he is. Later on in the story, his parents say he is of age. So that usually referenced how old a man was when he could go into the army, which would be 21. So, And now his neighbors say, well, what happened to you? He said, I don't know. I'm healed. This guy put mud on my face. But how did it happen? I don't know. Who was it? I don't know. It's Jesus. That's all I know. And so they took him to the religious leaders. I'm, I don't understand that either, but they took him to the people that are supposed to know about what God is going to be doing. And they, the Pharisees say to the man, what happened to you? Well, this guy, Jesus, he, he healed me. Basically, he healed me. When did he do it? Today. Except the day was the Sabbath. Commandment number four in the Jewish religion was honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy sacred, set apart for God, not to do any work. The Pharisees were the religious elite of the day, the super religious. Actually, if you study the history of Phariseeism, you'll find out that the reason the Pharisees started was because there was corruption in Judaism, and they came and started this, this branch in order to bring greater orthodoxy and to push out the, the worldliness of the Jewish religion. And now, talk about a slippery slope, and now it was at the point where these religious elite would take the commandments of God, keep the Sabbath day holy, don't do your regular kind of work. And now they interpreted what God had said and they went beyond what God had said, and they defined exactly what was okay and what wasn't okay. And their response to, to this miraculous healing was, what? Healed him on Sabbath? Oh, that can't be God. Now, can we just stop for a moment? There, there's this danger that we look on these stories and we count ourselves removed from what's going on. But to enter into the story, we realize Jesus did something incredible and amazing in this story. This man had never seen in his life. He'd never seen a sunrise, never seen a sunset, never put his eyes on his parents who had taken care of him his whole life. He had never seen a thing. Can you imagine Jesus healing you and now your experience is sight? All you want to do is celebrate and go look at things. Where's the cake? Where's the cake? Nobody wants to give him any cake. They're just asking me these questions. Who is Jesus? Well, he can't, he can't, be, he can't be man of God because God wouldn't heal anybody in the Sabbath. Can't be God. And on and on the questions go, and on and on they go, and on and on they go. In fact, we don't even believe this guy was, was blind. Well, call his parents. Okay, call his parents. His parents came in. Now, the parents knew if they gave the wrong answer, they'd get kicked out of the synagogue. 
And so the Pharisees say, okay, now, is this your son? Yes. Was he born blind? Yes. So what happened to him? We don't know. All that we know is he left home today. He was brought to the place he usually begs, and we set him there. We went home, and now he sees. That's all we know, really. This Jesus, well, we don't know anything about him. So then they call back the man in again, and on and on and on it goes. And then they finally decide they're going to kick the man out of the synagogue. And he's kicked out. And Jesus comes up to him. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Sir, I, I don't know who he is. Tell me so that I can believe. You're speaking to him. Can you see me? He says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. In, in, his, in his pain, Jesus did something that no one else could do. Jesus came into focus. Everything changed. With the questions swirling around him, all kinds of fighting and discord and difficulty and converse, adverse opinions all around the event, some of those people missed what God did. And actually, we can be like that too. We have our own rules of what should happen and what God can do and what God doesn't do. And we, we seem to have them in a box like the Pharisees did. It's easy to do that. And well, God, God doesn't really work in that way, does he? Not on the Sabbath, goodness, no. Well, we could develop the same sorts of things. And what Jesus wants to do is he, he, he's not going to live in a box or in walls. He, he steps over the fences and he opens the gates and he knocks down the walls and he goes where people are open to receive and he does something amazing. And we may not understand, maybe in your life today, so much stuff going on you don't understand and, and it's almost making you want to step away from, from the faith. You're so discouraged and despondent. I want to close by saying again, there may be so many things that you don't understand, but you don't have to understand everything to believe something, to believe in something, to believe in someone. And so I want to encourage you in the midst of all that stuff, focus on your relationship with Jesus. Everything else will fall into focus at some point, but it starts with him. Can we stand together? And for those of us who have joined us online, thank you so much for being here and for being with us today. Uh, I just, again, want to encourage you this Friday. We have a, a service. A communion will be, will be uh, served. The, the service is from 7 to 8. It will not be on Facebook Live, so if you want to participate in, in any way, it's, it's going to have to be here. And then on Easter Sunday, we, we actually have five people getting baptized, which is amazing. Thank God. And we'll be hearing their story and uh, looking into God's word and reminding ourselves that because Jesus is alive, everything has changed. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all that you've done. And Lord, in these days when there's confusion and questions and doubts all around us, in our, in our own hearts and minds, Lord, help us again to remember it doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, that we've got questions. We're always going to have questions. We don't have to understand everything to believe in something. And Lord, that is to put our faith in Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless. Thank you so much for being here. I hope to see you Friday night. Uh, I did mention the chair team. And uh, speaking of chairs, we, we do like to pile them in piles of two. But please remember, there, there is refreshments served in the lobby. So don't leave. Uh, go grab a drink. Stay in the lobby. Come back in to to uh, having more space in here, but we would love it if you wouldn't mind to stack a couple chairs for the charity. Thank you.